thank you very much. Um, I can see from the crowd that he's attracted that uh, my guest today needs very little introduction to all of you, but for the sake of convention, just humour me. He's, of course, one of the world's foremost fantasy writers, indeed with his near... Two million. In fact, I think he's gone over two million now. Two plus million Twitter following. He could definitely be described as um, the most popular fantasy writer in the world. From his award-winning Sandman series of graphic novels through the novel Coraline, a BAFTA-winning and Oscar-nominated movie which followed, to American Gods, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, and so many more, his macabre imagination and storytelling skills have made him a bestseller and won him literary fans of the like of Norman Mailer. His latest book, Trigger Warnings, is a subversive medley of stories and poems, fantasy, gothic, scary, and even poignant. Uh, let's get Neil Gaiman to tell us more. A warm round of applause for him, please. microphone and an iPad. Of course, residing in America, you'll be no stranger to the book tour. It's, it's true, but I'm not doing one this time. It's great fun. I think I've retired from book tours. Um, so this is much more a sort of mad assemblage of things that people had asked me to do. Um, <laughs> but a, I, I, a bit like the book, a mad a lot assemblage. Like, a lot like the book. I went to... I started, I flew to Dublin, where I was given the James Joyce Award, uh, came here, uh, did some mad writing on a secret project that is not yet re revealed. By the end of tonight. No. Nope. Oh, yes. No. Nope. <laughs> and then uh, last night, I gave the Douglas Adams Memorial Lecture uh, as a benefit for Save the Rhinos at uh, the... Royal Geographic Society and hopefully saved a couple of rhinos. And uh, I think at that event credited Douglas Adams with pretty much starting your career as a writer or inspiring I, your yes. career as a writer. Why, why was that? Um, I was a 22-year-old journalist really just starting out and I um was inspired to go and interview Douglas by an editor, just saying, if you could get us an interview with Douglas Adams, I'm a huge Hitchhiker's fan. I thought, I'm a huge Hitchhiker's fan. I phoned his publisher, wound up a week later interviewing him in Islington, and then interviewed him again a few months later. And uh, a couple of years later, a publisher needed somebody to write a book about Douglas and hitchhikers, and because I'd done those interviews, I got to uh, go and do the book, and lots of interviewing Douglas, lots of rummaging through his filing cabinets and press clippings, lots of talking to him. And I came away from that book, Don't Panic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Companion, feeling very confident that I could write in a classic, clean English humor style. There's a, there's a very, it's a style, and it's a way of writing. And I thought, I can do this. I've been doing it, writing a non-fiction book. Why don't I do a fiction book? And I wrote about 5,000 words of a slightly macabre thing which began with a baby swap. And then having finished And then it, things went downhill. Well, at that point, <laughs> I stopped. I ran out of time, because Sandman was happening. And I'd sent this thing to a few of my friends to read and uh, got nice comments back from them, but was busy. And then about eight months later, the phone rang and it was Terry Pratchett saying, hey, that thing, that thing you were doing, are you doing anything with that? And I said, well, well, no. And he said, well, either sell it to me because I know what happens next or we could write it together which from my perspective is an awful lot like having Michelangelo ring you up and saying, hey, do you want to do a ceiling? <laughs> um, so I said, well, let's do it together. Yeah. And, and it was great. It was, you know, writing Good Omens with Terry was the best possible apprenticeship. 
But it's unusual for a writer to enjoy writing with another writer. I mean, one of the great benefits of, of being an author is that you can go off, be on your own, and play God, isn't it? So how did it feel in a, in a democratic union like that? Well, it wasn't democratic, because... Because you called the shots. No, because Terry called the shots on that one. Um, but I didn't mind, because I was, at that point, doing pretty much everything in comics, which was a democracy... Um, in which I called the shots and and got to work with lots of wonderful artists and people, but at the end it all came down to me um, writing the panel descriptions that people would then have to draw. With with Terry and with me, it was it was very um, the process of writing was basically a desperate need to make the other one laugh. Neither of us particularly thought this was a commercial project, that it turned into good omens, that it became this, you know, turned up on the, the BBC's list of the 100 best loved books and all of that kind of stuff. That was, that was nothing that we imagined. At the time, we were basically just doing a bizarre William Brown parody, just William parody. For and the ocean, uh, you know, that was sort of a weird cross between Just William and The Omen, and it was to make us laugh. And uh, I'd get up every day. I was I was pretty much nocturnal at that point, so I'd get up, up about one o'clock in the afternoon, and there would always be a little flashing light on my answering machine, which we had back in those days. They had tapes in them too. It's long, long ago. You don't need to and describe the mechanism to me, sadly. I wasn't but describing it to you, the but there were people the out there who were going, what is he talking about? And I would Quite a lot of them. I would press a button, and a tape would... Re okay, so tapes were these things. They were plastic. <laughs> Thank you, Apple, and, for changing our world. And, uh, and there would be a voice, and Terry would be going, get up, get up, you lazy bastard. I've just written a good bit. And, uh, Are you? Uh, you said you were noct nocturnal in those days, and a lot of your writing would suggest that it could only be written in the dark <laughs> intimacy of at uh, late night. Uh, and and in fact, it, there's something quite incongruous about the idea of you sitting there with you know the sunlight blazing through your window as you write. So are you still a nocturnal writer? Or? I'm nowhere near as nocturnal as I used to be. I used to be a wonderfully nocturnal writer, um, and now. I fall asleep, and so I'm rubbish. And I mean, the, the, probably the scariest story in that book, Click Clack the Rattlebag, um, was actually written in Melbourne um, in high summer during the day with the blazing sun around me, which was very reassuring. So even though I was building a scary place in my head and, and a dark house, I was writing it in the blazing sunshine, which is a good way to write. I'm very glad you brought up the book, because one of us had to. <laughs> um, and I wanted to first talk to you about the title. You called it Trigger Warnings. Why? Um, I think mostly because I started getting absolutely fascinated by a debate that is going on in America over whether or not... Okay, so a trigger warning is something that gets put onto things. It's a term that, it, that began on the internet, particularly to warn people with post-traumatic stress disorders that something might upset them deeply and trigger them, uh, throw them back into horrible past things. And it was a very sensible thing, I think, if you're if you're... If you have a stream of images going past, as on Tumblr, if you have, you're, you're wandering deep into the realms of very peculiar um, fan fiction, you may want to be, you may want Why to- Why did you start laughing before he'd even got to that bit in the sentence? They've, they've been there. They've wandered through those areas of the, of the web. Tumblr. It's the places, you know, there are places where you really want to put your wellies on before you actually go reading things on the web. Um, so I think part of it is, and, and it made total sense to me that trigger warnings would happen and that you'd have them there. And then there have been movements recently agitating for them in colleges, in universities, and to be put on 
things that could possibly need them. So Romeo and Juliet would have a warning explaining that underage sex happens in here and murders and, and uh, suicide. And you're going, no, I don't, I don't think I want that. I, no, there's, there's people, Smooth. it's wrong. Yeah. And so I, st I was just fascinated by that debate. Um, and I, I'm also fascinated when I started noticing that people were talking about things that I'd written and putting trigger warnings on them. Well, I was going to say, one of the and things you said was that, that, that you'd done it in order to uh, preempt because you know that one day you're going to end up with one. And I wanted to ask how you'd feel about that because a, a large part of what you do is, is, is very much sort of focused on uh, eliciting a response. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, that doesn't mean you want to traumatize people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. But 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 what you do is subversive in, in, in a sense. And if it stops being that, well, it, or if they're warning that it is. And I think one of the functions of being an author, um, or at least of being an author like me, is that one of the things that you want to do as is you want to turn to your reader and you want to say, it's OK. You can trust me. We're going to walk together into a dark, scary place, but I'm with you. Everything's okay. And then you walk with them into the dark, scary place, and then you let go of their hand and run away. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, and then I, you really mess them up. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think, and I, I love the fact that I, I was, so before we came on, we were talking in the green room, and, and Ariella was saying, this book, scary stuff. And I'm saying, well, there are nice things in there too. And she was saying, yes, but you don't know which ones they are. So it winds up just as worrying going through because you may be reading, you don't know. Is this one of the nice ones or is this one of the ones that looks nice until you get into it and, and you have a point? Um, How do you go about, uh, in, in, in this book you've, you've chosen to actually do a very generous thing. I mean the introduction is probably the longest piece of writing in the book. Um, and you go through almost every one of the stories with a with a with a, a sort of an explanation of, of where it stemmed from or what it was about it that struck you. Why do you want to engage in that very sort of personal one on one, uh, or what feels like one on one? Though it's obviously one on ten million, um, sort of di discussion with your with your readers. When I was a kid, I loved short story collections. Um, I, I can remember the covers. I can remember some of the contents of the anthologies that I loved. And I particularly loved books where the author would tell you the circumstances under which stories were written. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that I, was, I wanted to be a writer. I really wanted um, to grow up and, and tell these stories. And it was the nearest you ever got to being ushered behind the curtain and shown how things worked. And it made it, it made it very real for me. I talk in the introduction about Harlan Ellison um, writing short stories in shop windows in America. And I, I just remember reading one of his introductions and he was talking about some collection, uh, you know, some story in that collection which he wrote in a shop window. And it was amazing to me. I, it, it was, it made things suddenly simple. It made what up until that point might have been magic and might have been art and was somehow unknowable. It made it into a craft. But I wonder how many people here today uh, read short stories, because it's a very interesting thing about short stories. They would seem to be the absolutely perfect form for now. You know, our attention spans are shorter, we're all in a hurry, you read them on a tablet quick or on your phone or, or whatever. But actually, um, writers love to write short stories and publishers hate to publish them because a lot of the time people don't seem to embrace them with the enthusiasm that one might expect. They really don't. Um, I'm, I, I say in the introduction that I am incredibly lucky because I'm now, this is my third mainstream short story collection. And that's, that's sort of 
nobody gets to do that. Uh, Stephen King gets to do that. Maybe there are a couple of people, but um, you're definitely discouraged by publishers, except by mine, who now have had two of these out, and, and that's like short story collection. They go, yes, <laughs> we like them. Um, but even then, I, it's, it's a short story collection is probably going to sell, for me, uh, maybe a third of what a novel would sell. There are people who would automatically read novels who find short stories weird, they find them off-putting, they don't like the experience of just getting into something and it's over. Um, they don't like the, the weird kind of box of chocolates approach where you're not quite sure what you're going to get and one of them does have a spring surprise that will come out through your cheek. But that is quite, un that is quite unusual because uh, as you uh, yourself say in the introduction, um, in fact, just read the introduction and we'll just, we'll just go off and have something to eat, shall we? Um, but, but in the introduction, you, you, you say, you know, a, a good short story collection should have a theme. It should, you know, it should carry on and have a shape and a theme and, a, and actually I'm not going to do that and I don't do that. And, and, you know, this is full of surprises. Yes. I, I, love, um, I love short stories where you pick it up and it's all the same kind of thing from beginning to end. You know, and I, and I have infinite respect for those people. Ramsey Campbell, wonderful writer of, of Liverpudlian horror, and Ramsey Campbell short story collections, you know that each one is going to... They're going to be similar. They're going to take you to horrible places in and around Liverpool, and uh, and lives are going to be doomed during them, and it's kind of a nice feeling. You you come away from a Ramsey Campbell short story collection, feeling like you're hallucinating monsters and in Liverpool. But other than that, it's great. Um, for for me, uh, short stories are these they're these day trips or week trips. Um, they're places I go to try things out. Sometimes they're ideas that I wouldn't want to do at novel length. Sometimes they're places I wouldn't want to be at novel length. Um, sometimes they're... I, I love the idea that I can go, this is a funny, silly idea. I can just go and do funny, silly here for four pages. There's a story in there um, called and, and Weep Like Alexander, which is about an uninventor. And it's just a classic club story. It's set in a pub, and it's about, it explains the reason that we don't have jetpacks and flying cars and At all last. the things. Exactly, because, you know, when I was a kid, I watched Tomorrow's World, I knew we were weeks away from living in the Jetsons world, and it never happened. So this is a story that just explains in four or five pages why it never happened. Um, but I love the fact that I can just do that, and that I can go and do something else, and then one day I can put all these absolutely not similar things together in one place and leave people to cope. Have, have any uh, of your stories ever grown into a, a larger form? Um, well, yes. Um, the, the most obvious one is my most famous failed short story, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Um, <laughs> Way too long. That's which what was, I say. It really was. A <laughs> it was meant to be a short story. It just kept going. And, and I figured I'd write it in about four days and send it as a gift to Amanda who was in Australia making an album, and at the end of the first week, I'm going, this is, this is a bit long, and at the end of the second week, I'm going, well, maybe it's going to be a novelette. She must have been getting very impatient as well. Uh, she actually didn't quite know. It was meant to be a surprise, which was kind of good, because that way I wasn't continually letting her down. <laughs> um, I just loved the idea of writing a sto story that I was going to give her as a present. And uh, finally, I finished it, and by that time, she'd left Australia and had come back to mix the album. <laughs> and when I did the word count, I finished typing it up from, from my notebooks and, and discovered that I'd accidentally written a novel, um, which is a very odd thing to have done. You don't expect to write novels accidentally. You, you know, it's, it's supposed to be hard work for a start. Well, yes. 
I think I think I think Ocean at the End of the Lane may have been hard work, um, but I was enjoying it too much to notice if it was. Uh, I note with the uh, reviews of this book, many of which are utterly superlative, including uh, an amazing review from the New York Times uh, uh, yesterday, last night, yes. I think. Um, and but every single reviewer picks different stories as their favourites, and I wondered what your favourite stories. Are. What a lovely question. Yeah, that, that's definitely the, the weirdest thing about doing a short story collection is every review will say, fantastic short story collection, only let down by these duds. And then the next review will say the same thing, but they'll pick different duds and different favorites. And you'll go, well, hang on, they were duds according to that guy, but they're your favorites. Um, my favorite, I, I really like Black Dog the story at the end, um, which is an American God story, mostly because it nearly drove me mad writing it. It, it, it was all of the effort. Um, it, was, it was one of those stories where you find out what the plot is by writing the story, and it keeps shifting on you, and then you get to the end of the story and you go, oh, that wasn't what I thought you were going to be at all. I thought these people were going to do this, and I thought this was going to happen. But... Are they but the I'm hardest here. or the most interesting to write? Both. Um, absolutely both. They're, they're definitely the most interesting because the story feels organic. It feels like it has something to do with you. You remember writing it, um, but you also feel like the first reader. Um, my favorite is that you've got to choose yours. My favorite um, is down to us, I knew I couldn't remember, I'm so hopeless, so senile, uh, down to a sunless sea, which is an incredibly poignant, as you say, you know, some of the stories you just don't know what you're going to get, and that just made me terribly, terribly sad. I also don't think you'll be getting a postcard from Boris Johnson thanking <laughs> you for your description of the Thames in it. Um, what They've cleaned it up in, in recent years. There are, there are fewer corpses. Um, <laughs> But, uh, no, that was, the, I mean, it, it is weird, the point where one of the things I love about short stories is that they always start with something weird. Um, sometimes they'll start with an image. Sometimes they'll start with something that you're, you're trying to get out of your head. Um, and what tends to happen with me is I'll have a weird fragment of something and then something will come, somebody will come to me and say, we're doing a story, we're doing a collection, and we need something about this. And the combination of whatever they ask is the this. And the thing that I have in my head tends to become the big starting place for the story. Um, but that was very weird because The Guardian came to me and said, it's World Water Week. Would you like to write a short story for World Water Week? And I'm going, that has to be the least interesting thing I've ever been asked. I mean, water's great. It's water. Um, but World Water Week, would you like to do a story? And I just started thinking about water as a setting and the idea of um, the Thames and the sea and the rain. And then thought, thought of a woman standing by the Thames, waiting for her son to come back, and all of a sudden it was a story. And uh, I used to read, there was a period of about a year when my bedside reading, I found a five or six volume uh, Newgate calendar, which is the, the um, these collections of all of these criminal trials and criminal histories, and they, they normally end very sadly, um, from about 1680 through to about 1730. And I would read one or two of these before bed each night. And there were, there were a number of uh, unfortunate cabin boys uh, who had terrible things happen to them that I'd never quite been able to get out of my head from the Newgate calendar. So and you I, found a place so for I them. found a place for one, yes. Uh, I'm going to turn to you all in a moment and get some questions from you. So I do hope you're preparing them in your mind if you haven't got one there already. Um, in the meantime, just going back to the idea of trigger warnings, 
I wondered why you, I mean, you, you believe, I think it's fair to say, that, that it's actually, that it's good for us to, to be scared, to feel that sort of surge of adrenaline that you get when you're taken by surprise or taken somewhere you don't want to go or, you know, and, you know, as is exemplified by the idea of trigger warnings, we're becoming a, 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 a sort of a species more and more risk averse, afraid, you know, afraid to ruffle anyone's feathers, including our own. So why do you think it's important that we still have that sort of vicarious, uh, you know, allow that, that vicarious surprise and, and terror into our lives? Well, let me answer that in two different ways, because I absolutely stand up for anybody's right not to read something they don't think they should, that they're not ready for. Um, I love the way that kids self-censor. Kids are fantastic at going, I don't want to go there yet. I don't want to read that. I don't want to look at that. And, uh, and going there when things are ready. Um, Didn't you foist something on your daughter that turned out I, Well, that's be... actually one of the reasons why I learned that. I, I, I had my daughter, Holly, came home uh, from school aged 11, a huge fan of um, the Goosebumps series. And she loved them. And I went, oh you like those, I've got something you're going to love. And uh, headed down to the library and came back with a copy of Carrie. <laughs> and gave it to her very proudly. And uh, she spent most of the rest of, of her adolescence reading books about happy things that happened on the American prairie. And she glares at me still whenever Stephen King's name is mentioned. <laughs> And I thought, ah, okay, that was a bad thing to do. Don't do that. You don't want to push people, necessarily. Um, but having said that, I love taking people to places they wouldn't have gone. I love them thinking things they might not have thought about. Um, I love being willing as a writer to go, this is a weird, scary, upsetting, dangerous place and I'm going to go there, um, and it's okay because I'm going there as a writer. I, I, my, my, it, it is also true to say that my mind does not entirely work the same when I have my writer head on. Um, I am a very squeamish individual. I'm absolutely squeamish unless I need something for a story. And that was mostly brought home to me the day that I wound up phoning a friend of mine who was a doctor and uh, had done a number of autopsies to find stuff out for an autopsy sequence I was going to write. And because I was going to write it and I needed to know this, um, everything, nothing was revolting. Everything was just incredibly interesting. I'm saying, okay, so what do you take out for? Okay, so you make the Y-shaped incision, then you're taking the, okay, and you've got the bucket, right. That's what goes into the bucket. That's, and, and going through it and then saying, well, and then he's saying, and I, I put everything back in at the end in the same order I took it out. And I'm going, well, why, why the same order? And he's saying, because otherwise it won't fit. I'm going, that's brilliant. Okay. Um, and it was just terribly, terribly interesting. And, and I suspect that some of, some of the interest actually came through in the story. I wasn't trying to use it to revolt. I was just... I was fascinated because I needed to know it. Have you ever, um, I'm coming to you now, so get ready. Have you ever uh, taken yourself imaginatively too far in the way that, you know, your daughter perhaps experienced reading Carrie? Or is, is, is there, or in your reading perhaps, because I suppose as an author, you're, you're, you're in control of what you're putting on the page and that makes a huge difference. You can pull the, the strings. Uh, whereas as a reader we can't, you know, but, but, but when you've been reading, have you ever ventured beyond the pale for even you? As a kid, I, don't, I, I think as an adult, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, and as an adult, what I do is if I read something that I find really disturbing and upsetting, I just put it into a short story and let it disturb and upset everybody else. Like a flu Safety vector. in numbers. Exactly. <laughs> Everybody, you can all be upset by this thing that just upset me. Yes, we will be in it together now. Um, 
some of the scariest and most upsetting bits of Sandman, I think, happened like that. But I think, I, I, but I remember being really disturbed as a kid reading stuff that I probably shouldn't have read. Um, a story by a man called Charles Birkin, B I R K I N, long forgotten writer of horrific in a sort of Grand Guignol style short stories. And at the age of probably nine or ten, I read a story by him called The Harlem Horror. And uh, The Harlem Horror is about a couple who lost their daughter about three years before. She was kidnapped and hasn't been seen since. And the wife still believes that she's dead and the husband isn't sure. And to try and cheer themselves up, they go to a, uh, they go to a, a, a freak show in a carnival and where this creature with golden eyes, this horrible, deformed, beautiful creature, but seems to recognize them and keeps grasping towards them and, and the wife is freaked out and they leave. And uh, then about six months later, they read this account in the paper of, of this evil doctor who's been arrested for kidnapping children and turning them into nightmarish freaks, which he's been selling to freak shows. That's seriously and, creepy. And I read this aged about nine. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> that's, that, that's not good. I wish I'd never read that. And it wasn't even... It was the sort of... And the things that upset me weren't so much the idea of somebody would kidnap me and turn me into some kind of horrific freak. Um, what upset me was the idea that a parent might not recognize the child and that you as a child might see your parents and try and reach out to them, but they wouldn't know it was you. And that was so profoundly upsetting. And it was like something that I wished that I didn't have in my head at that point. Let's see if we can beat the trauma of that story with some of these questions tonight. <laughs> uh, lady here le uh, lifted her arm first of all. I think we've got a microphone, yes we do, to pass around. Hello, good evening. Hello. Uh, that was truly disturbing, thank you for that. Um, I, uh, one that I uh, just want to ask you, I yesterday picked up The Sleeper and the Spindle, I'd never read it before, and uh, one of the things that struck me was um, how I would describe you, and I think looking at your audience here tonight, which um, I suppose didn't really surprise me too much, I would describe you as a feminist author. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about you is the fact that you write women so incredibly well as a man, and I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your inspiration for your female characters. I, I think part of it began for me when I was a young writer writing comics, and I was looking at the comics that were around and was completely baffled by the lack of women in them. And uh, on the one hand, there didn't seem to be any women. And on the other hand, there were people who were meant to be women, who, who talked, spoke, and behaved like men with melons strapped to their chests. Um, <laughs> And I would go, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Unless the writers of these comics were born and raised on that Greek peninsula that no women are ever allowed on, um, they must have encountered women at some point. How could they fail? They must have had mothers or sisters or just, just met somebody at some point. How could they fail? to write women. So I was, I was baffled and just sort of went, all right, I will just try and make about half, maybe slightly more than half, statistically, of the characters in Sandman women, just like they are in real life, and let's see how that goes. And I enjoyed it an awful lot and was faintly gratified over the next five years when the, the first signing lines I did for, for Sandman were rows of people with penises. Everybody in the signing line had a penis. They may have had two, I don't know, but they were definitely <laughs> completely vagina-free <laughs> signing lines. And then slowly, um, you'd get this phenomenon where 
people who did not have penises would show up in the line. And, um, and I would get happier and happier. And eventually, it seemed to be about half of the readers were women. And, and comic store owners would come up to me at conventions and they would grab my hand and pump it and say, dude, I gotta thank you, you brought women into my store. <laughs> and I would try not to say, if you just swept the floor, maybe they'll come back. Um, so that was where it started for me, it was writing, writing Sandman and just wanting to put women into my stories. Right. Um, we're gonna, I'm moving you on okay, because moving. otherwise we're never going to get to talk to everyone uh, who wants to ask a question. There are uh, many this hands. lady here. No, there are more than you can see. It's true of all questions. Hello. Hello. Um, I started reading Goosebumps when I was six, and when I was 17, I picked up Stephen King, and now I've got about 60 Stephen King books in my home. <laughs> so, so it was the right how, instinct. That's how you do it. You <laughs> leave it alone. Um, but I wanted to ask you two quick questions because one you briefly touched on. One of the best books Stephen King did was Pet Cemetery, and the reason it was good was because he addressed a real fear he had of his son nearly dying in an accident. And I wondered if there was any story, short or otherwise, that you've written that you've put a real fear that you've had into the story. And the other one I wanted to ask is I love your fairy tale versions. I just read Snow Glass and Apples last night, and I love it. Um, I wondered if you ever thought about doing The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, doing a version of that. Um, well, A, it's kind of been done now. Um, and B, um, I tend not to want to do Hans Christian Andersen because he was a real writer. And he was a person, and I know who he was, and he told his stories. I, I love retelling. I always feel a lot more confident retelling and reinventing stories when... Um, Anon is the author, because I go, the ghost of Anon is not going to rise and say, that wasn't what I meant. <laughs> Whereas, uh, so I think, I think that's what always puts me off doing, doing Snow Queen. And things. what about fears? Um, I think my own fears tend to show up all the way through my books. If, if um, you know, if I wasn't scared of things, they wouldn't show up in there. Um, but, you know, some of the, the scariest things for me um, are, are moments where characters get embarrassed. You know, I can cope with pretty much anything else, but actually embarrassing characters is really hard. And there were moments, particularly in Neverwhere, where I had to actually embarrass Richard. And it was like, oh, God, no, this is going to be so hard. They, they were, you know, you write them sort of like that, tapping it. <laughs> But is that your great fear then for yourself of being um, embarrassed? No, I mean my greatest fears, I think, are the, are the they are the usual. They're, there's something bad happening to my kids, um, something bad happening to my wife, my eyeballs liquefying <laughs> and rolling down my cheeks like huge tears. That's that worries me a lot. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Uh, gosh. Uh, well, I'm going to go up to the back here, this gentleman straight in front of me. You're incredibly prolific as an author, but I'm curious, how much of your work do you not publish? How much of it do you go, no, not doing that? Um, once it's finished, I tend to publish it. Um, but there are always things in notebooks, always things churning away, always things that are being worked on or written in chunks, um, which if I die they'll people go well, what was this and and here's half a thing and here's the beginning of something and so and they and they they quite often wither on the vine um and sometimes i just forget about them i, I was um i had somebody going through some of my notebooks recently just trying to figure out what was in them all and uh, she pointed out this wonderful beginning of a short story called the pope of the zeppelins and she said, this is so fantastic. What happens next? And I said, I, I have to write that one, don't I? That, I? And it was, it was great. I just started it and forgotten about it. So one day I will, I will go back and finish The Pope of the Zeppelins. So it's, they, they tend not to be, I mean, there's some stuff, there's a few stories that just didn't work. Um, but mostly it's things that are sitting there in bits. 
I think there was one more question up in this area. Yes, the, the lady there. I just wanted to ask, obviously you've written a lot of stories, comic, short stories and novels and things. But which character do you find that you kind of connect with the most? Oh, um, when I was writing Sandman, the character I tended to cr connect with the most was Merv Pumpkinhead, who was a pumpkin-headed janitor who got to comment grumpily on the doings in the story because he got to say all the things that I would never quite let myself say or think about the story. When I go, you know, everybody's acting kind of ridiculously here, but he could, he could say those things. Um, mostly the characters that I connect with most, though, are the ones where I just take me and put me into a story, because then it's just me. So, I mean, Ocean at the End of the Lane is a seven-year-old me. The stuff that happens to him may be fictional, the family may not be my family, but that's me. And in this book? Um, there are a couple of me's wandering through that story. Give us a clue, book. a hint. Oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Um, the lady over here. I now teach at uh, your old school, Ardingly, and um, you've referred to your childhood and you know uh, how much you enjoyed reading short stories then. And I was wondering whether or not your education provided you with any inspiration, or um, and linked to that, whether or not you think schools, what could be happening in schools to inspire, enable you know the children to write creatively as you do, or so amazingly as you do. I. I was very lucky. Arding Lai, when I was there, um, you could tell. I was in Arding Lai College Junior School as a scholarship boy, and you could tell exactly when they'd had money for the school library because you would get tranches, waves of books um, from certain time periods. And they had, they'd obviously done one big library by in the early 1920s and another in the very late 1930s and then they didn't have any money till the end of the war but somewhere in about 1957 they bought another batch of books and uh, what was so great about that for me was it wasn't until I was an adult and talking to experts in Edwardian fiction that I discovered that I'd actually had a fantastic education in Edwardian fiction um, by, by just going through those shelves. Um, I think, which I, I suppose takes me to my biggest thing, which is I think freedom to read and school libraries. Um, if I'm going to point anybody at anything, it's encouraging school libraries, encouraging curated school libraries, encouraging libraries as a safe space, and encouraging kids to use them. Um, the joy of a library is you don't know what's going to be on the shelves. And you're going to pick up books because the covers look interesting. You're going to pick up a book because somebody else did. You're going to pick up a book because the book that you wanted isn't there, but this thing's there. And the best way, I think, to create good writers is to create good readers. Another question. Yes, you raised your hand earlier, so we must come to you right at the back there. Can you see the gentleman? And then I'll come to you here in the front, and I think that's going to be about all we've got time for. So thank you all very much. They say art is subjective, and you spoke about Tumblr briefly. Has anyone ever reblogged a story or something of yours that you've just gone, that is so not what... Where did you even get that from your brain? That No. I don't know that's ever happened in the rebloggage, but I do remember it once happening um, with an audio book. And um, this was about 15 years ago. And I went downstairs, and my son Mike was listening for reasons never explained um, to an audio book of, of mine. It was uh, my very first audio CD, Warning Contains Language. And he was listening to a short story called Baby Cakes. And Baby Cakes was me. Um, it was written for Peter, um, the, the 
people for the ethical treatment of animals. And it was taking the sort of swifty and modest proposal idea off in a strange directions. What would happen if one day we woke up and the animals had gone? Would we still be able to test medicines? Would we be able to test cosmetics? What would, be, what would we eat? And the answer, obviously, is babies. Um, and so I, I wrote the story. And uh, I just remember coming downstairs and walking in and not quite tracking on what, was, what I was listening to. And I'm listening to somebody, a faintly familiar voice, but I cannot place it for a minute, saying these terrible things and going, what kind of sick, mo oh Jesus, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the lady here in the front, uh, in the cream sweater. Hi. Uh, thank, first of all, uh, thanks for what you do. I uh, just want to ask, uh, uh, you write for Doctor Who sometimes. Uh, is it like doing fan fiction? I love, I, I get fascinated by the concept of fan fiction because I don't think there are easy borders between things. I'm, I will happily tell people that yes, um, you know, people say even more, fan fiction. It's as if you're writing fan fiction. I'm going, absolutely. There's a, there's a Sherlock Holmes story in Trigger Warning. There is a Doctor Who story. Are they fan fiction? Well, I was paid for them. Um, but I'm a fan, and I cannot imagine the, the engines with which I wrote them to be any different than the engines that anybody writing Doctor Who fan fiction or Sherlock Holmes fan fiction uh, would have written it. Um, I took enormous joy in writing both of those things. But then I'm somebody who got to write, um, I just remember the, the joy I took the first time I got to write Batman for DC Comics and actually have him say something that I was, and that the power and the the, the the feeling that I might possibly be God that I got the first time when I was writing The Doctor's Wife and the first time I got to write Interior TARDIS. And I'm going, in my head, I'm in the TARDIS. And if this works, it's going to happen. And it was, it was going, I know how God feels. It must be just like this. Um, is it fan fiction? I'm a fan. It is my fiction. Um, do I think, I, 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 I don't think the, I think the borders between fiction and fan fiction are so blurry and have been so blurry for so long. You know, Don Quixote, um, there, was, there was a period of time between the publication of part one and part two, and during the, the intervening time, several people came and wrote their own part twos because they loved the character. So... Don Quixote Part 2 has a lot of stuff where Cervantes is saying, I didn't actually do that stuff. That stuff in that book is stuff that people made up, which is <laughs> glorious that you have this sort of character commenting on these fictions about him that other people have written and, and not necessarily endorsing that fan fiction, which I think you're also always allowed to do. Um, yeah, it's fan fiction and I'm a fan. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, but particularly thank you to Neil Gaiman. Thank you, Mariella.